delighted to have our neighbor and our colleague from the New Bedford Whaling National Park with us today, Jan De Silva. Jan is the Cultural Resource Specialist at the National Park, and she's going to tell you all the other places she works too. You can call her phone, there's a long list of places that she serves. She has two bachelor's degrees. One is from Princeton University in History, and then from Roger Williams University in Historic Preservation. Jan serves on the New Bedford Historical Commission, and you may remember that she's a return guest lecturer. She showed us the Mariner's Home and talked about its historic significance um, last spring. So Jan will tell us a lot more. Um, she has a really interesting topic today. She's hoping it will be very conversational, so you in the back have to participate too. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jan DeSoma. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, I will tell you the names of the other two parks I work for, which is Roger Williams National Memorial, which is located in Providence, Rhode Island, and Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park, which is a, uh, located within the Blackstone River Valley corridor, and it extends from Pawtucket all the way up to Worcester. And right now we are, it's a new park. It was legislated in 2014, and we are working on uh, making sure we have a visitor center and some other things. People can already visit the park, there's a river there, but we just, we're just we working on making it uh, very visitor friendly so you can go up there and see what's happening there. So my topic today is African American women in New Bedford before the Civil War and their relationship to the Underground Railroad. And uh, as I mentioned to Sarah earlier, this is really a hard topic to talk about some of the reasons are uh, women were not really documented during the 19th century. They were considered not part of the public realm, so there was not a lot of newspaper articles. There was not a lot of photographs. It's before, it's, some of this period is in, uh, before the daguerreotype, so there's not really a lot of material culture pertaining to this group of people. And also because of their limited economic status. There's less things to collect. There's no fancy clothing. There's no fancy uh, China ware. If they did handmade goods, they, they weren't collected and kept by the family. So that makes it harder to kind of bring items so that you can see how they lived. I'm just giving you the sense. And plus, I, as Sarah mentioned, I prefer to be a conversational speaker. So if you have questions, just raise your hand and we can take them in order. Because actually, I kind of hate when people have questions and have to wait till the end when they have a burning desire, maybe in the middle of the lecture, to ask the question. So New Bedford. New Bedford had a reputation for having a relatively large African-American community during the 19th century. In fact, percentage-wise, it was, it was probably larger than Boston. It, by 1860, there were 1,518 out of 22,300 people of color in New Bedford. We don't know how many were freeborn and how many were formerly enslaved. We do know that the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act did impact the number of formerly enslaved people in New Bedford. They would have left after 1850 because they would have been worried about being recaptured and sent back south into slavery. So some of those people would have emigrated to Canada after that time. Why New Bedford? New Bedford was known as a place where freedom was valued. There were few or no formerly enslaved returned to enslavement. The community made sure people were kept safe. There were a lot of people here who had family ties to people who came from the South. I have a list of families. I'm going to be going rolling through this, so please, if you have questions, ask me, because I talk pretty fast. Some people came through, the, known to have come through the Underground Railroad, such as Clarissa Davis. She was, her travel was documented in William, Still, in William Still's book the Underground Railroad, and I actually had that story which I wanted to share with you. Cl Clarissa Davis arrived dressed in male attire. Clarissa fled from Portsmouth, Virginia in May 1854 with two of her brothers. Two months and a half before she succeeded in getting off, Clarissa had made a desperate effort but failed. The brothers succeeded, but she was left. She had not given up all hope of escape, however, and therefore sought a safe hiding place until an opportunity might offer by which she could follow her brothers on the UGRR. 
Clarissa was owned by Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Berkeley of Portsmouth, under whom she had always served. Of them, she spoke favorably, saying that she had not been used as hard as many others were. At this period, Clarissa was about 22 years of age, a bright brown complexion with handsome features, exceedingly respectful and modest, and possessed all, of, and possessed all the characteristics of a well-bred young lady. For one so little acquainted with books as she was, the correctness of her speech was perfectly astonishing. For, for Clarissa and her two brothers, a reward of $1,000 was kept standing in the papers for a length of time, as these articles were considered very rare and valuable, the best that could be produced in Virginia. In the meanwhile, the brothers had passed safely on to New Bedford, but Clarissa remained secluded, waiting for the storm to subside. Keeping up courage day by day for 75 days, with the fear of being detected and severely punished and then sold, after all her hopes and struggles required the faith of a martyr. Time after time, when she hoped to succeed in making her escape, ill luck seemed to disappoint her and nothing but intense suffering appeared to be in store. Like many others, under the crushing weight of oppression, she thought she should have to die ere she tasted liberty. In this state of mind one day, word was conveyed to her that the steamship city of Richmond had arrived from Philadelphia and that the steward on board with whom she was acquainted had consented to secrete her this trip if she could manage to reach the ship safely, which was to start the next day. This news to Clarissa was both cheering and painful. She had been praying all the time while waiting, but now she felt that if it would only rain right hard the next morning about three o'clock to drive the police officers off the street, then she could safely make her way to the boat. Therefore, she prayed anxiously all that day that it would rain, but no sign of rain appeared till towards midnight. The prospect looked horribly discouraging, but she prayed on, and at the appointed hour, three o'clock before day, the rain descended in torrents. Dressed in male attire, Clarissa left the miserable coop where she had been almost without light or air for two and a half months and unmolested reached the boat safely and was secreted in the box by William Bagnell, a clever young man who sincerely sympathized with the slave, having a wife in slavery himself, and by him she was safely delivered into the hands of the Vigilance Committee. Clarissa Davis here, by the advice of the committee, dropped her old name and was straightaway christened Mary D. Armstead. Desiring to join her brothers and sister in New Bedford, she was duly furnished with her UGRR passport and directed hither hitherthwart. Her father, who was left behind when she got off, soon made his way on north and joined his children. He was too old and infirm, probably to be worth anything, and had been allowed to go free or to purchase himself for a mere nominal sum. Slaveholders would, on, such, on some such occasions, show wonderful liberality in letting their old slaves go free when they could work no more. After reaching New Bedford, Clarissa manifested her gratitude in writing to her friends in Philadelphia repeatedly and evinced a very lively interest in the UGRR. The appended letter indicates her sincere feelings of gratitude and deep interest in the cause. New Bedford, August 26, 1855. Mr. Still, I avail myself to write you these few lines, hoping they may find you and your family well, as they leaves me very well and all the family well, except my father. He seems to be improving with his shoulder. He has been able to work a little. I received the papers. I was highly delighted to receive them. I was very glad to hear from you in the Wheeler case. I was very glad to hear that the persons were safe. I was very sorry to hear that Mr. Williamson was put in prison but I know if the praying part of the people will pray for him, and if he will put his trust in the Lord, he will bring him out more than conquer. Please remember my dear old father and sisters and brothers to your family. Kiss the children for me. I hear that the yellow fever is very bad down south now. If the Underground Railroad could have, could have free course, the emer emigrant would cross the river of Jordan rapidly. I hope it may continue to run, and I hope the wheels of the car may be greased with more substantial grease so that they may run over swiftly. I would have wrote, but before circumstances, I would have wrote before, but circumstances would not permit me. Miss Sanders and all the friends desire to be remembered to you and your family. I shall be pleased to hear from the Underground Railroad often. Yours respectfully, Mary D. Armstead. 
so that you know that's one yes Uh, she may not have written the letter. She might have had somebody write it for her. It looks like whoever wrote it didn't know how to spell, though. But spelling was not standardized until Ar Andrew Carnegie, so. Um. So that's just one story. Oh, yes? What was the Vigilance Committee? The Vigilance Committee? So there were different vigilance committees in communities. There was one in Boston, there was one in New York. And what they did was it was a group of people who were committed to anti-slavery. And people would, they were, for lack of a, for the easiest way to put it, they would be the people who were kind of like the conductors. So people would contact the vigilance committee to move between different cities. You know, they would know where to direct people, like you would go to the, Frederick Douglass went to the New York Vigilance Committee and they sent him to New Bedford. Yes? At the very beginning you said that New Bedford was a good place because people were careful to Would you repeat that question? She hasn't finished it yet. <laughs> Right. I wanted to know why. Um, they felt safe because there was a larger anti-slavery community. There was more a community of people of color who were dedicated to keeping them safe. Is it true that no um, slave was ever taken from New Bedford and sent back south? As far as I know, that's, that's what the story is, that no one was ever taken from New Bedford. Okay, so I mean, one reason people wouldn't have been taken, well, the, the community was very close-knit. There were a lot of people here who had familial ties with each other. So I've kind of, uh, I mentioned Clarissa Davis, who came up here because her brothers and her sister were here in New Bedford, and then her father came here. The other, another family, I have a few families that I kind of wanted to talk about during this presentation. So one is the Bush Clark family. Does everybody know Bush Cleaners? Did you know that was started by an African-American? It was started by William Bush. He opened a laundry in New Bedford during the 19th century. And he actually came here from DC, he and his wife, Lucinda. Now, Lucinda was part of a different family, the Clark family. She and her brother Archibald and her brother Mary came to New Bedford, not all at the same time, but that's what I meant by familial ties. Someone would come and then they would make a life here, and then they would say, hey, so-and-so, it's great up here. Then another family member would come up, and then another family member would come up. So um, looking, what I looked at, it looked like maybe Archibald came first, and then Mary, and then Lucinda. So when Archibald came up, he did work as a mariner, I believe, and lived here. He married, uh, um, actually, I'm not going to say who he married, because I don't have it here. But his sister Mary married uh, Louis Temple, who created the Temple Toggle Iron in the 1840s and was a blacksmith here in New Bedford. And Lucinda came from DC. She did not move up here with William Bush until the late 1840s, 1849 or 1850. And she and William came up here after the Pearl Incident. I don't know if you're familiar with the Pearl Incident, but that was a schooner in the DC area that was captained by Daniel Drayton, who decided that he would um, bring a large number of formerly enslaved people to the north. He had 77 people on the boat, but the boat got captured and he was sent to prison. But uh, history tells us that Lucinda and William knew Daniel Drayton and probably worked with him. So because of that, because they knew Daniel had kind of, he had gotten arrested, they left DC so that way they wouldn't have been caught and they came to New Bedford. All their children came to New Bedford too. They had a few children. Both of them lived here until they died and they're both buried in rural cemetery in the southern, southern part of New Bedford. They also have ties to Leonard Grimes who is a pastor of the 12th Baptist Church in Boston, which still exists. It's on the, the street, the street has changed, but it still exists. And 
That was known as the Fugitives Church because they had a lot of people there who were formerly enslaved. So one thing else I can say about the Bush family is they were very close to Daniel Drayton. Daniel Drayton, uh, once he was freed from jail, you know, he was a broken man. His family left him. He had no place to go. He came to New Bedford in 1857. He wound up committing suicide in the mansion house. He's actually buried here in New Bedford too. And, and the reason why he's buried here is because William Bush and the other African-American anti-slavery members or anti-slavery proponents uh, had him buried here. They paid for the plot. They found somebody else who donated money for it and he was buried here in New Bedford in 1857. Another family story is the Gibson family, and that's Betsy, Jane, and Helen Gibson, and Catherine Molyneux. They came to New Bedford with Patrick Gibson, and Patrick was a slaveholder in the South. Betsy was his, uh, I'll call her a concubine. I'm not really enamored of slave mistress at this time, and, uh, and I'll tell you why. Mistress implies consent, and I don't think you can consent if you're a slave. Um, so I decided to not use mistress anymore. There's not too many other appropriate terms to use now, though, but, um, but he, he stated that he wanted to free them, so he brought them to New Bedford, again, for the same reasons. People knew New Bedford to be a place where African Americans had more freedom than other places. There were some jobs for them there was a large African-American community. So he brought them up here and they stayed with Nathan and Polly Johnson on 7th Street. He wanted, them to, he wanted Helen and Jane to get an education. He gave money to Nathan to pay for this education and they stayed there. But in 1837, he had passed away. His estate, they, he had not freed them with his will. So his estate began looking for them because they wanted to sell them. And Nathan actually was arrested with kidnapping them. He refused to send them back. He suspected a plot to sell them back into, well, to return them to slavery. And they wound up staying here. Some, uh, I think maybe Jane, I'm not sure about Helen, but Jane is buried in rural cemetery. Now Jane and Helen did marry well-known anti-slavery men of the time. Jane married Philip Piper, who was the son of William Piper. And I'm gonna talk about the Piper family later. And Helen married Shadrach Howard, who was the son of Ruth Cuffey Howard Johnson and the grandson of Paul Cuffey. And I'm just explaining all of this to you just so you get a sense for the community. Because for me, this talking about people doesn't mean anything unless you can kind of put them in context of where they lived and how they lived, that's the important part because we can't really ask them what they did, but it's important to know that these people weren't living in vacuums, that they were actually interacting with each other, they were living near each other, they were going to church with each other, they were all in the same organizations, that this was a concerted effort up by them to make sure that nobody was sent back into slavery. Yes? So would you say that there are parallels between the established society in New Bedford at the time, so when we're talking about the Roaches and, um, and, and all the other uh, families in New Bedford who have these connections, the intermarriages, is, and so the, the, the free blacks in New Bedford, their society somewhat paralleled that, is that correct? I would say yes. I think, and that's some of the stuff that doesn't really get conveyed to people, that, you know, Ruth Cuffey Howard married Paul Cuffey's grandson, and then her second marriage after he died was to Richard Johnson, who was another well-known anti-slavery person and also a very uh, astute businessman. He and his two sons, they rivaled Nathan Johnson in terms of their, their business dealings. And so, yeah, I would say they do. But until you kind of put all the pieces together, you don't really see that. And then Catherine Molyneux married Jeremiah Sanderson. And Jeremiah Sanderson lived here in New Bedford, but uh, you know, one thing about the 1840s, it was the beginning of the gold rush, and 
here in New Bedford, a lot of gentlemen who were African American wound up going to California, including Nathan Johnson, Jeremiah Sanderson, uh, the Johnsons, William Carney. William Carney went in the 1860s, but they all went there to make money, and some of them returned and some of them didn't. Jeremiah Sanderson never returned. And there's nothing that says whether or not Helen, uh, whether or not uh, Catherine went with him to California, so I couldn't tell you if she went, but he went there and lived out the rest of his life there. The Piper family, who I mentioned earlier, the parents, William and Amelia, were from Virginia. Uh, I don't know if there's any documentation to say that they were formally enslaved, but they were from Virginia. They had children who were born in Virginia, Robert, Philip, Sarah Ann, Amelia, and Augustus. And then they had one daughter, Rebecca, who was born here in New Bedford. And they were, they were known anti-slavery anti activists. William was mentioned in John Jacob's memoir. The daughters were part of the New Bedford Fre Female Union Society. They participated in anti-slavery fairs. So they, are, they were very active in that part of the community. Then we have the Johnsons, Nathan and Polly Johnson. And uh, I don't know if you've been to their house at 21 7th Street, which still exists. First free home of Frederick Douglass. And uh, they are the most commonly known Underground Railroad operatives here in New Bedford. And that's because Nathan was identified in Frederick Douglass's narrative, his first narrative from 1845, since that was his first free home. Another person who stayed in their house was Carolyn Harris and New Bedford, and this is, is Sarah here? Oh, there she is. Sarah, I was telling Sarah earlier today that New Bedford's very fortunate in that it has a lot of records available that you can research. And there's records called Overseers of the Poor Records, which were started in the 1840s once New Bedford became a city. And I would say that it's not, but New Bedford's not alone in having these types of records, and I'll explain what the records do. If you needed anything from your city, you usually had to prove that you were a citizen of that community for you to get something from the welfare people. Uh, I know that they have that in Rhode Island. I know they have that here in New Bedford. If you could not prove you were a member of that community, they would say, no, you need to go back to where you came from so you can get taken care of by that community. Now, in New Bedford, I'm not really sure they said that to people because these records show people who are fugitive slaves on the record, the docket, receiving aid. So Caroline Harris was documented in 1861 saying that she was staying in the rear of 21 7th Street with her child and she received a quarter ton of coal in 1861. So we know she's another person who stayed in the, in the uh, Johnson house. The thing about the Johnsons is we have no idea how many formerly enslaved people stayed at their house. No idea at all. I mean, not only did they own four properties, but we have no way of knowing who stayed there. I mean, they owned 96 Spring Street. They owned 1719 7th Street. They owned 21 7th Street. And then there was a little candy shop that Polly had her store at. Nobody knows what was going on in those houses because, of course, with the Underground Railroad, you had to keep it relatively secretive because if you didn't, then people could get captured and sent back into slavery. Yes? Um, I'm wondering if people who were in solid families had a better chance of getting out under the, with the Underground Railroad than individual um, people by themselves. I'm not really sure how to answer that. I wouldn't necessarily think so. Uh, you might move faster when you're alone. What if somebody gets sick? What if you have a young child? What if you have old people? I mean, that's why it took Harriet Tubman so many years to get her parents out of slavery, because you have to do it under cover of night. Most, uh, you know, a lot of people would do it around Christmas time because people were not watched as carefully. And it's cold. You don't know where you're going. You don't have a map. You don't have GPS. Uh, 
So I, I, I think you actually almost are, you could be better off going by yourself. But people traveled in groups, they traveled alone, they traveled whatever way they could to get to freedom. Yes? Um, are there any known images of Paul Johnson? No. Nope. I know of one image of her granddaughter, but that's it. And that makes it difficult because, like I said before, you can't, you can't really document what people looked like. Even the Paul Cuffey silhouette is a silhouette. There's no, there's no anything of Paul Cuffey either. We only, we don't have anything. So then we have the Douglas family that I mentioned earlier, Frederick and Anne. They came to New Bed. Oh, I'm sorry. No. It was for the whole city. What was the question? Jane, maybe if you don't mind just repeating the question. Okay. She asked me if the overseers of the poor was only for African Americans, and the answer is no. It's actually for everybody who's a citizen of the community. And those records are where? Uh, here in New Bedford, they're at the library. They're under the city documents. The oh, the, the books are under city documents, too. Thank you. I have a set in my office as well. And I know they're getting ready to digitize the ones that they have in the library. Looking for hands in case there's any up. Okay. So Frederick and Anna Murray Douglas came to New Bedford in 1838. And we know they stayed at 21 7th Street. We don't know how long they stayed at 21 7th Street. It might have been a few months. I don't think it was more than six months. Th three of their five children were born here in New Bedford. And we know that Frederick also voted for the first time here in New Bedford. And we know that he started his anti-slavery career here in New Bedford because he went to Nantucket in 1841 for an anti-slavery speech. And he spoke about his background and um, people wanted to hear more from him. So that started his career. They were both very active in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. They were Methodists. That church was on 2nd Street. I don't know where it was. I have not been able to find an address for it. Uh, that, that church did exist until the 1960s, but it moved to the Gallery X building. That was known as the Douglas African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. So trying to can never get rid of architectural stuff. So to me, it's like you can't really visualize a community unless you can take the information and tie it to a location and tie it to a story. And that really helps put the whole story in context. And Anne is shaking her head because she does the same thing. <laughs> so then we have the, the other Johnson family. I don't know if you're familiar, how many of you are familiar with Frederick Douglass' story here in New Bedford? Okay, so you know when he came here, he was actually Frederick Johnson. He was ac actually Frederick Johnson. That was a name that people would take. Johnson was a common surname for formerly enslaved African Americans. That's the name he took in New York. And so when he came to New Bedford, Nathan Johnson said, you know, there's quite a few Johnsons here. You might want to change your name. And was reading Lady of the Lake at the time and said, hey, how about this dude Douglas? Why don't you consider that name? And so Douglas became who he was, Frederick Douglas, no longer Frederick Johnson. But there are other Johnsons in New Bedford that we can speak of that aren't related. These people are not related to each other. So Richard Johnson, as I mentioned before, who's another anti-slavery anti activist, lived here in New Bedford. Not sure if he was formerly a slave. He seems to be, he seems to be a person that somebody should try to write a book on, to me. You know, someone who owned so many businesses, someone who was so active in the anti-slavery uh, circumstances, or he's, he's an active slavery activist. His sons, they owned a lot of different properties, sold a property to a church so they could build a church. I, mean, I, I would love to know more about him and his sons, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of information about them. 
but they were all active in the anti-slavery cause. Then there's the Jacobs family. Some of these people are tangential to New Bedford. They might have come through New Bedford, like the Jacobs family. They did not stay here, but they, at one point they came to New Bedford and were documented as being here at the time. And we know that they would have used the Underground Railroad to be here in New Bedford. So Harriet Jacobs, who's an author, she wrote Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl written by herself. That was published in 1831, came to New Bedford, stayed at the Grinnell Mansion with Cornelia Grinnell. She, um, she might have been a house servant, but she didn't stay there very long. And then her brother, John S. Jacobs, was actually on a whaling ship, the Francis Henrietta. He went out in 18, I think 1841, came back in 1843. Harriet, in her book, Harriet says that she was, you know, she was trying to escape her white master because he wanted to have sex with her and she did not want to. She actually chose to have sex with another man and have his children just so she could avoid having sex with the other master who owned her. And she wanted to escape, but circumstances did not allow her to because he had so many wanted ads and everything out for her. So what she did is she escaped to her grandmother's house and she stayed in her grandmother's attic for seven years in a small attic at the top of a house her own children were in the house and they did not even know she was there. That's how surreptitious her life had to become for her to avoid this man. She stayed, it, it was in Edenton, uh, North Carolina, and at some point she was able to get out and escape from slavery. So um, not sure what path she traveled, but at some point she did come to New Bedford. I, I wouldn't even say she came to New Bedford directly through the Underground Railroad, but we know that she used that path to get out of slavery. So next I want to talk about the needing help part of, and that's the overseer of the poor's, poor records. You know, there's a lot of, with the overseer of the poor records, they actually take your name, your age, where you're from, your children, and then they identify how much they've given you for the year or years. and. Uh, Prices seem a little low compared to what we're used to, but you know, at the time, I'm sure all these people needed it. I was trying to correlate some of this information for you over the weekend, so um, I not only looked up names, I cross-referenced them to the directories. So that's one reason why I have my little map that I'm gonna bring out. And I'm just gonna kind of tell you some names and what people got and kind of identify where they lived. So let me bring this forward. And I should say, for posterity, I am a friend, fan of Catherine Grover, who wrote Fugitives Gibraltar and some other documents for the National Park Service. And uh, Catherine is a great researcher. This is her map, and I'm giving her credit for it because I did not make this map. <laughs> And uh, she spent a lot of time documenting people, where they lived, the directories. She has huge databases of the community. And her book was written for, um, it was a book on abolitionism in New Bedford from the, like 1800 to 1860. And if you want more information, I suggest that as, an, as a source for you to go to. So, the first people I have are Walter Hawkins' family. And they, this family came to New Bedford from D.C. in 1845. And in 1846, we have the first record of them receiving help from the overseers of, of the poor. They received a quarter ton of coal for $1.58. So, I can't even imagine how much a quarter ton of coal is in terms of the size of it. A quarter ton of coal, that's 500 pounds of coal. Who gives out 500 pounds of coal? That's, I mean, that's the thing that kind of sits in my head. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So we know that, that in 1845 and 1849, the Hawkins family lived on Middle Street, which is uh, North, Mill, Kempton. It's right here, Middle Street. So they probably lived in this area. So all these little numbers you see here, that's one part of the African-American community. There's another part down here. This is known as Dog Lake Corner. Then you see other people who are in this area. So there's definitely community boundaries that people don't realize. This is from the 1836 directory. It has all the addresses of everyone in it. And the 1836 and 1838 directories are, are great because they identify people of color with a little C. So it's easy to find them. You know who you're looking for. You can find them pretty easily. But you can see that, like here, you can, there's a church here, and it has a little cross. And so it's, it's easy to kind of get a sense where people live. Jane, can you reference something modern on that map so we have a sense of where Sure. Where this is County and Kempton right here. Uh -huh. County and Kempton. So where's the Whaling Museum? <laughs> uh, Whaling Museum is right here. This is Sender Street and Rodman, and this is Union Street right here. This is William Street. So people lived north of this area, west of this area, and south of this area. Oh, where am I going? So then we also have James and Keziah Fuller, who came to New Bedford from Norfolk, Virginia in 1846. They actually moved around a lot more. <laughs> they lived on Kempton Street, on Allen Street, which is down here, and Bonnie Street near Forest, which is around here. They're all renting at the time. They're renting. You know, earlier when I mentioned that because of economic ability, so what that, that becomes clear when you look at directories because most of the people I found, they're all identified as laborers. So they're not whaling merchants. They're not whaling captains. They're probably not making a lot of money, which is why they have to go to the overseers of the poor for coal and for groceries and for rent and for what have you. They're not making a lot of money. Why they're not making a lot of money, I can't tell you, but they're not. Yes? Can you give us an idea of who the overseers are? Was that an elected body or an appointed body? I actually don't know, but um, I would assume it might be an appointed body. It's part of city government. You don't have a sense of how big a group that was? I don't think it's a very big group. Decisions. It's probably not a very big group. Yeah. It's kind of like what the, the water board. Yeah. Was the overseers of the poor. I'm sure it's the names you know. Like I think James Bunker Congdon was one of them. So, um, yeah. Yes. Are there records of um, you know, how did they find work? Was it all kind of underground or? or I. Table or? I don't know how they found work. Um, I only know of a few labor stories, like Frederick Douglass was not able to work as a caulker because the white caulkers would not work with him. So I think that's why most people are laborers, because they were just kind of hard scrabbling their way through life. I mean, it's probably better to be free doing this than being a slave, because if you get a quarter, it's your quarter instead of your master's quarter. But they're, they're not earning a lot of money. Any other questions? When you say that the Quakers were actually founders of getting this started and going right through the No, I would not. <laughs> I need to know that because I keep thinking, wow, didn't they do a heck of a lot for me? Well, I mean, the Quakers in New Bedford, they were formed in New Bedford, but remember a lot of Quakers, had, they had a huge schism in the 1830s. So a lot of the people that we assume are Quakers are Unitarians. <laughs> so. 
Yes? Well, the records that I looked at over the weekend, I looked at like four years, there weren't a lot of, there weren't a lot of African Americans in them. It was mostly white people. Maybe. I, I couldn't answer that, but it was mostly white people. I would say it was like maybe 10 to 15 percent African American. <coughs> yes? Um, and their children, were they able to go to school in the I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, could they go to school in New Bedford, where the schools integrated? I'm not sure how integrated the schools were. Yes? What do you classify free? <laughs> what do I classify? How long were they really free? It seems like they had no money. They had to depend on uh, lowly positions to be able to even survive. We wanted that they don't get reported to the people who want them. Well, I guess I would classify free as not being considered chattel property not having a slave master beat you with a whip, not having a slave master determine who you're going to marry or not marry, or having him father your children if you don't want him to, not having him uh, feed you enough food, if you're working, him taking all your money. So, I mean, if you have your own destiny, I think that's more free than not. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm curious about the relationship of surrounding communities. Do you have like Fairhaven or Mattaquish that were they on board with this or quietly I I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think what I know about those communities. It seems like race lines are very different even now. You know, as you travel toward the east along the coast. So I just wondered how long. I mean, the reason they would have stayed in New Bedford is because it's easier to hide when people look like you. I mean, today, Mad Poise is 98% white. <laughs> today. So, <laughs> kind of hard, kind of hard to hide. <laughs> yes? Fifteen hundred eighteen, one thousand five hundred eighteen, out of twenty-two thousand three hundred. So less than ten percent. But that was considered a larger population than Boston or New York or Philadelphia. I was wondering how that happened, and I, I was thinking the whaling industry, where there was the circle that went to the Azores, and men got on and off, and then to the Canary Islands. And Caribbean and then back to New Bedford, do you think that is what created the larger population? Um, well, in a later time period, maybe, but before the Civil War, I would say it's mostly because of the family relationships that I was talking about. So if you have one family member and then five family members join them, that brings them up there. I would say between like 1860 and 70 and 1900, that's when you see more people coming from Cape Verde and uh, the West Indy Islands, you have a lesser number of African Americans in the whaling industry at that point. They've moved on to something different. Yes, Anne. So I've always understood it, and maybe not in this earlier period that you're discussing today, that the support industries of the whaling industry, you know, provided a, a labor and jobs for folks. So even those initial family members that may have came to New Bedford would that have been the purpose because it was work here? Yes. And then obviously the population increased because they brought their families up. But the, let's just say the, the initiators, the, the, the first black families that came from South was because there was work here. I think they did come because it was work here. It's just that it wasn't high paying work, but it was work that they could make their own living and they could earn their own money and they didn't have to give it to somebody else. You know, so. Um, like I said, Douglas couldn't be a cocker here, but he could work. They all worked, or they did domestic work. They lived in people's houses, like Nathan Johnson, when he and his wife first got married in 1820, they lived in Charles W. Morgan's household as their house servants. So people would have lived in or lived out, and, uh, and that's how they worked. 
there was a variety of things that they could do for a living. Right. And then if you pair that up, I know that you're talking about the Quakers, but even early on, the Quakers, you know, were, were, were anti-abolitionists. Some were, some, but no, some... But, but, but the Quaker, so if you, if you combine the, the Quaker nature, let's say, um, with the, the abundance of jobs, would, were those the indicators that brought people up, or, or you can't really... I don't know. That? I mean, I know a lot of people say the Quakers, but then there's also the history of Quakers owning slaves. Yeah. And there's the history of some Quakers, you know, not allowing people to become a friend. Like Nathan Johnson tried to join the friends, but he was turned away. So, um, I don't know. So is it somewhat of a myth? I don't know if it's a myth. I'm just saying it's a mixed bag. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then I'll get back to you. Uh, what about the Unitarians? Were they more accepting? How do you define the criticism? The ones that they were Quakers and the Unitarians. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define accepting. Okay. Uh, not standing in the way of, of their progress. In the well, you know, I, I think that's the interesting thing about anti slavery. I think all of us assume that we would be anti-slavery activists, and um, most people were not, because it was dangerous. Judith, are you waiting to say something? Well, the Unitarians in the 1840s had a rabid anti-slavery minister. He spoke from the pulpit very vocally about uh, uh, anti-slavery. But by the same token, I don't know how many of them walk the walk as well as talking the talk. Frederick Douglass's first money turned in New Bedford was shoveling coal for the minister of the Unitarian Church. Thank you, because th thank you, because that's kind of how I would. Put it. <laughs> it's it's a difference. That's why I meant by accepting. What do you mean by accepting people? When you when you think about what it took to be active anti-slavery activists, you could lose your life, you could lose your house, you could lose your children, you could lose your job. Lydia Mariah Child never had any money because she was an active an anti-slavery activist. They were not lauded for that. I mean today we do, but at that time period they were not. Dan? I don't know where it is, but um, it's commonly thought to be with Elm Street garages. They don't identify the number, they just say they lived on Elm Street. Okay, everybody ready? Yes. Um, <laughs> are there, you mentioned Lydia uh, Mariah Child. Are there other people who come to mind who took risks? to help. I just named a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Are there other people that I could name who took risk to help? Um, I don't know how to answer that. Because I'm trying to, are you talking about white people? Yes. Um, I don't have that information. Yeah. I, think I mean, like someone, someone who's studied it a little bit, that that at some level, everyone took a risk to some extent or another. And I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about the 1850s ladies that we have in the park who, who talk about that sort of portray some of the, the thoughts and feelings of that time. And, oh, thank you. I have a big voice and thought I really heard of you. Um, the, our 1850s ladies who commonly come to our park, Ruth and Abby, they travel through time. And they're from the 1850s, and come see them if you haven't seen them. But, they portray some of those struggles and some of the actions that they might have taken or, or thoughts that they had about that time. So I, I think to some degree, some might have been willing to talk about and go to anti-slavery meetings. Some might have been willing to personally 
place someone in their home. Some might have been willing to look the other way, knowing, oh, that person's an enslaved person, but I don't need to say anything to anybody about it. I could, but I'll choose not to. So I guess like so many things that we do in the course of the day, there's kind of a continuum, you know, off to one side, all the way to the right. How much of a, an activist do you want to be about something that you firmly believe in? So think about something that you believe in. And you think, well, how much do you do for that? Do you give a little money, or are you standing somewhere chained to a building? Or, I, you know, there's a, there's a continuum. And so I, I feel like everyone took risks to some level. I mean, I guess for me, this topic is about African Americans, so that's why I'm trying to stick to that topic. Um, just because most people don't talk about African Americans as anti slavers Everybody, everybody always knows about the white anti-slavery activists, but people don't really talk about the African-American. And to me, African-Americans were going to be active in their own freedom. That's, they have family members who are slaves. They, they may have come from that themselves, but they're very rarely given the credit for it. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, you, you had your hand up. <laughs> I think what you just said actually is so much more important than what I was going to say. I, I'm the Unitarian minister in Fairhaven, actually, and I just was going to name um, that, you know, a lot of people, white people, did in various ways try to help, but one of the things that doesn't get named, and I'm researching this, sum, this, this summer in the city, looking at the um, connection between Massachusetts and the Underground Railroad in Kansas City, one of the things that doesn't get named a lot is the capitalist underpinning. Like, white people were willing to help, but they were very much out to make a buck. And it, that was really legitimized by the system. Like, it's okay to be willing to help as long as it's financially in your interest. And both the Unitarians and the Quakers end up pulling out of the Underground Railroad settlement of Quindaro people from Massachusetts once it's no longer financially viable. They, they abandon that settlement. Oh, thank you. That's good to know. Sure. Every name that you have mentioned, Douglas, Johnson, Guam, we're really never given that name other than the name from there. She can't hear you. Sorry, can't hear you. Talking too much. I can't. Okay. Uh, the names, surnames, all the people that you have mentioned, but they, were, they, they, they did not have names, did they, originally? So they would, they would be from the owners of the slave owners. Well, that's almost every black person in this country. <laughs> who was born here, who, who, did, who emigrated, whose family emigrated here from, you know, a long time ago. I, I mean, my family's been here more than 100 years, but I don't know what name they had before they came here. Nobody has, no. I mean, Paul Cuffey does. His father's name was Kofi. Kofi meant Friday, and they anglicized it to Cuffey. So some people did, some people kept their names, but... You have to remember, keeping your name is something you could be beaten for. Keeping any kind of African survival means that you're not going to be a good slave. Keeping your language, keeping your religion, keeping your songs, all of that was, was destroyed. I mean, that's the whole point of slavery, to destroy all of that so you have no past. but I saw some hands. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of deep in here, isn't it? <laughs> this is what I do to them at work, you know? We have all these conversations and they're probably afraid of me when I come in the room. Because <laughs> we, we have to address things that, you know, people don't normally address. <laughs> I wish you had more records, it's a shame. Well, when you have no records because you're not a human. You're a chattel. <laughs> You're a thing. <laughs> I mean, people need to always keep that in mind, too. You are a thing until 1865. You're only three-fifths of a person, and you're a thing. OK, where was I? Now that we're way off the track. <laughs> and that's OK. I'm just going to try to change it around a little bit.
So I'm going to skip away from some of the people and talk about organizations. So here in New Bedford, there were African-American organizations. The New Bedford Union Society, which was a men's group formed for anti-slavery activism. There was the New Bedford Female Union Society formed by women. And I was going to read something to you. So this is from the August 23rd, 1839 issue of The Liberator. Anti-slavery fair, New Bedford, August 12th, 1839. Dear Brother Garrison, a number of females in this town, feeling desirous of contributing their might of influence to sustain the cause of justice and humanity, have united under the name of the New Bedford Female Union Society, the specific object of which is to raise funds in aid of the Liberator and Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and as a means to further the object, we propose to hold a fair on the first day of January 1840 and wish through the medium of your paper to solicit the aid of our friends in the neighboring towns to enable us to accomplish this, our first undertaking, with the assurance that any favors received will be reciprocated when they shall make a similar attempt. Donations of fancy or other articles common on, su on such occasions will be thankfully received and faithfully applied to the proposed object and may be directed to Mr. William Piper, number 87, 6th Street, New Bedford, Mass. But while we are asking the aid of our friends, we would not have it supposed that we are idle ourselves we meet regularly twice in each week, ply our needles and fingers, talk over the wrongs of our countrymen and countrywomen in chains, and pray that the time will soon come when every yoke shall be broken, when all oppression, whether it be Southern slavery or Northern prejudice, shall cease in our land and the world. Please accept our sincere wishes for your future peace and welfare. Yours for the oppressed, Christina F. Newell, Sarah Ann Rozier, Cynthia Potts, Mary Ann Kendall and Amelia J. Piper, who are the managers. And Sarah Ann Rozier and Amelia J. Piper are daughters of William and Amelia Piper, who came from Virginia. So I just, you know, I, I wanted to bring that forward just so you get a sense that the community was active in working to free itself and that people were doing things. Because like I said, when you look at history books, it looks as though, um, no one had an interest in helping themselves. That's always taken out of the history books. And you know, I think it's, for me, it's a disappointment that people don't talk about that uh, and, and only focus on other people's assistance. Then there was also the Wilbur, yep. People you just mentioned were black people. Yes. They were black. There was also the Wilberforce Debating Society that was here in New Bedford, and uh, William Henry Johnson was a member of that. I um, think maybe uh, I was reading, uh, Frederick Douglass was a member of that. And that was because of William Wilberforce. By the late 1830s, England had actually uh, freed all the slaves in the Caribbean. That's August 1st, 1834. And it's known as Emancipation Day. And actually in New Bedford, they used to have eman Emancipation Day ceremonies on August 1st of every year, up until the 1850s. And in fact, they actually had them longer because I was involved in a group in 1990s that used to celebrate Emancipation Day in Rhode Island. It was a big holiday that they had just for the emancipation of slaves. There were also churches here in New Bedford that were known active slavery activists, such as the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church on 2nd Street, the Second Baptist Church on Middle Street, and the African Christian Church. Uh, there is one church, the Bethel AME, Baptist, uh, Bethel AME Church, which actually um, has a story of being known to not be as anti-slavery oriented as the other churches. And that's when I, you know, I mentioned earlier, like just because you think you would be anti-slavery activist doesn't necessarily mean you would, depending on whether it's your color or not, because it depends on how much of a risk you want to take to survive. And I think at Bethel AME Church, they were not willing to take the risk, whereas the other churches were. They were willing to prevent people from going back into slavery. But at Bethel AME Church, 
there was an incident where, you know, other members of the community went and said, you can't do that. So, so it's kind of interesting how you see the gamut between willing to take a huge risk and not willing to take any risk at all. So, um, yes. No, they came and took them back into slavery. They came and took them back into slavery. And, and that's, you know, there's quite a few stories in New Bedford about slave catchers coming to New Bedford, which is why the, the commentary that nobody was ever returned to slavery is important here. Because even in Boston, Anthony Burns was returned to slavery in the 1850s. You know, didn't matter how, the, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act meant you could come to any part of the United States to grab any person you suspected of being a slave. Just being North no longer gave you the guarantee of freedom. That's why people decided to go to Canada. They had to actually leave the country to feel free. Does anybody have any other questions? Because I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> yes. Like, say the person was in the Nathan and Polly Johnson house, they would move them to somebody else's house. And they, or if they, they were in a, pla a public place, then I know there's like kind of a riot that happened where some slave catcher went to a place to cap capture someone, and the men there actually used physical force to prevent them from coming in and taking people. Usually, yes. Not just yes. Kind of going in yeah. No, they'd be coming in for specific people. Yes. Select those black managers. Oh, wait. How could they survive? What do you mean? Well, when you were talking about people who organization take them away, to how could that actually, what protected them? Anything? No? You mean from people coming to get them? Because it was so, it was so known. Um, I don't know. I mean, people didn't necessarily say if they were free. Some of them might have had manumission papers. Some of them might have been free. Yeah, that, and that's, when, that's the thing, it's a risk. They're willing to risk their lives so other people can be free. Yes? Were they, the people who are coming to get them, were they government authorities? Or no. Privately employed people agitated for business? S probably they were either they were probably employed by their former masters because they were slave catchers. I mean, that's a common term, a slave catcher. And they were the, or they were bounty hunters. There are bounty hunters too because they would put a price on your head for you to be captured. So if you needed a way to make money and you were good at it, then you could do that. As an example, I'm just going to throw modern time out here. There is currently a TV show on WGN called Underground. And it is about the Underground Railroad and it just ended its second season. And they actually go into some of this and show it. So for Harriet Tubman, if they put like a $500 price on her head, anybody who's a bounty catcher is gonna try to find her so they can return her to slavery so they could get the $500. I mean, it's, there's bounty catchers today, so. It's not, it hasn't changed that much. I mean, it wouldn't have been governmental authorities, though. Because this is all, like you said, this is all for money. It's all for financial gain. Yes? Yes. I did read it, but I wasn't necessarily happy with it. <laughs> I thought it was a little too, um, um, 
it portrays the Underground Railroad at, as a uh, metaphor. And I'm afraid that people will take the metaphor literally and it, then that makes it hard. What made me think of it really was in terms of talking about the price of um, uh, catching a, a slave was in the, in the book. So oh. I think that's I think that's true. I think that part of the book does tell a lot of the stories so people can understand that people would go th and sometimes it's not just based on money. I mean, if this is like imagine if for Thomas Jefferson, imagine if Sally Hemings had run away from him with her six kids. Not only does he lose his six kids and Sally Hemings, but I'm sure there's an emotional desire for revenge or whatever. How dare you decide that you don't want me anymore? Loss of control. And loss of, and loss of control too. What was the book that she was talking The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. Yeah, so, I mean, that part is right, but then I'm just afraid when so many people don't really know the story of the Underground Railroad that they're, I mean, we have it here in New Bedford. People are always like, where are the tunnels for the Underground Railroad? <laughs> <laughs> so I think people are gonna take that more from the book than the things that you mentioned. And so I'm afraid that people will start looking for tunnels. And I think some people who read the book were, um, had the same feeling about, oh, you know, really wanted to know this part. The other was a, a little distracted. Yeah. Oh, that's good that we're talking about. You're welcome. Did you read the book? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no other questions, thank you for listening to me. And I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, have a nice afternoon. You're welcome. You're welcome.